Today we're going to be doing another networking video. But unlike my previous ones, this one's going to be focused on my broadband connection, which is something I've not really touched on before. And just right off the bat before I start, this is going to be one of my long rambly videos. It's probably going to be like an hour long, or hopefully not that long, but very long. So there'll be chapters in the video description and hopefully on the video seek bar. So feel free to skip to the parts that you want, because for some people, they just want to know about the connection. Other people want to know about all the backstory, the pricing, how I've installed it all. So I'm going to put all the information out there and provide sort of chapters so you can skip the part you want. But yeah, after many years, I'm finally getting around to upgrading my broadband. For years now, like literally since I moved in, I've been, been with Plusnet, where I've been using their 70 down, 20 a shop VDSL2 connection, which is a fibre to the cabinet connection. And I've been with Plusnet for much longer than that. In my last place I was on, I was with Plusnet, admittedly on a 40 meg-ish connection because I, I was far from the cabinet. The place I was before that, I was on Plusnet again at 70 meg because it was near the cabinet. So I've been using Plusnet's VDSL for probably about seven years, you know, a lot, long time. And as many commenters keep pointing out, oh my god, that's so slow. How can you live with 70 meg? I get gigabit, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, for a very long time, that was the fastest connection that was available on my property. So as much as it would be nice to have a gigabit connection, if it's not available on the property and there's not the cable into the building to do it, I can't get that. However, my Plusnet contract recently expired and they were charging me, I think, £42 a month or something for being out of contract, which is ridiculous. So I started looking around at different options. And as it turns out, that since I last signed up with Plusnet and now, my street cabinet has been enabled for GFAST. Now what GFAST is, is essentially like VDSL or DSL, but much higher speed. It only works over very short distances, so you have to be near to the cabinet, which thankfully I am. But it can go up to about 330 megabits. So that's a massive improvement. So even though I still don't have any fibre into the building or any sort of hyper-optic type system where it's you know fibre to a switch and then cats 5 to the flats or anything like that, I can still get a higher than 70 meg connection through, through GFAST. So that's what I'll be doing in this video. I'll be moving away from my Plusnet VDSL2 connection over to a GFAST connection from TalkTalk. And now as soon as I've said that, lots of people are probably freaking out and writing angry comments about how bad TalkTalk is and how it's going to be the end of the world and oh my god, I can't believe you're moving to TalkTalk. And in a second, we'll look at all the available GFAST options and you'll very much see why I've gone for TalkTalk because there's not many options out there. But one of the reasons I wanted to actually produce this video on moving ISP, which isn't really a big deal, it's not like I'm producing a video about moving energy supplier, is that there's not much sort of advanced user content there about TalkTalk. They do get a bad reputation, but a lot of the time when I read the negative reviews or watch videos about people complaining about them, it's people talking about things like the Wi-Fi signal doesn't extend to my bedroom, or they'll do a speed test but they're doing it on like a 15 year old laptop or a phone but they're standing miles away from the router on the Wi-Fi and it's like, oh look it's so slow, it's like yeah because you're not isolating problems or analysing things properly. And I don't blame people for, you know, not having huge amounts of technical knowledge and people writing bad reviews about them. Talk Talk's a mass market consumer ISP. You know, the sort of ISP that lots of people refer to as being the Wi-Fi company. You know, not everyone's technical and not everyone's network engineer, and that's fine. But I wanted to provide a more in-depth review as a more advanced user to really go and find out is TalkTalk Talk accept acceptable or viable as an advanced user connection, or is it as bad as everyone seems to make out? Because, Talk because Plusnet's a budget ISP, they're a budget consumer ISP, and I've been using them for years and they're great. So yeah, we're going to be moving over to Talk Talk. I just wanted to provide my sort of honest opinion and experience of how, of how it all goes. And as I mentioned with GFAST, there's not many options, and that's why I've gone with Talk Talk. So we'll take a quick look at all the available options, at least at the time of filming this video. Unfortunately, most ISPs have stopped doing GFAST. Well, most never offered it at all. Some have started offering it and then have stopped doing it now that fibre to the premises is more common because I think GFAST is quite expensive to roll out. So BT and Sky have already stopped offering it. Therefore, in the consumer space, the only two options available are TalkTalk Talk and EE. TalkTalk, Talk, which is what I've gone for, costs £39 a month for the 300 megabit-ish GFAST plan. It's, the profile is 330 down 50 up, so you'll get a bit lower than that. And that's the top speed you're going to get through GFAST. £39 a month, including rent, line rental. EE, on the other hand, is £46 a month. And realistically, as far as I could tell, was basically going to offer the same thing. Obviously, it's different, a different company with different backend infrastructure, but it's the same line profile. 
and you're basically getting the same thing. You're not getting any extras like static IP addresses. Neither of these providers offer that sort of stuff. And EE is £46 a month. So not only is the price difference going to push me towards Talk Talk there, £7 a month extra for EE, the other down downside of EE is that their router, the provided router they give you, supports GFAST. Now that's going to sound a bit silly saying that, but that's because if you sign up for EE, as far as I can tell, you're going to get their super router thing, they call it. That plugs directly into your phone line because it's got a built-in GFAST modem, and that's all you've got. Now, for the average user, that's great. But for me, I don't want to use the, their, an ISP's router. I'll never do that. I've always got my better equipment. So I would much rather have a standalone modem. Whereas with EE, you're not going to get that, probably. On the other hand, with TalkTalk, Talk, their router doesn't support GFAST, which means that when you sign up, an OpenReach engineer will come out and install an OpenReach modem. That means I can get that set up. That's happening in a couple of days. I'll then get an OpenReach modem. I can throw the TalkTalk Talk router back in the box, never to use it, and connect their modem directly into my router. And that saves probably about £120 on having to buy my own GFAST modem because they're not cheap. So yeah, that's what I've gone for. So yeah, that's consumer options. There are, however, obviously more expensive more options in the sort of higher end business slash prosumer type enthusiast ISP market. So out of those, the ones I sort of looked at were Fiber.net. They only offer the 150 megabit package though, so they don't go as fast. And that costs £59 a month plus £120 setup fee. And if you were to sort of smooth that setup fee over the 24 month contract that I have with TalkTalk, Talk, that works out to about £64 a month. Additionally, if you want a static IP address on that, that's £2.40 a month extra. So that's bringing it up to about £66-odd. Similarly to that, you can go to Cerberus Networks. They offer the 300 megabit plan, but that's £58.20 a month, with a £193 setup fee, so that's huge. And if you were to then smooth that setup fee out across 24 months again, you know, basically spread the payments in your head, that works out to £66 a month. And that does include a static IP, IP address. But that's a lot more than £39 a month to go to £66 a month for, sure, a slightly better ISP and a static IP address, but that's a big difference. Finally, there's obviously Andrews and Arnold, who are a very popular ISP with enthusiasts, and I would love to go with them one day, but I simply cannot justify the £75 a month it'll cost for the 300 meg GFAST, plus £75 setup fee, and then have to deal with the 5 terabit a month cap, which admittedly is a high cap and I probably won't hit it, but at £75 a month versus £39 a month, like... I just can't justify that cost. And sure, with TalkTalk, Talk, you don't get things like static IP addresses or IPv6. And that is a shame. However, if you look at the price difference between the £39 TalkTalk Talk and the £58.20 Cerberus Networks, that's £20. So with £20 a month, there's a lot of other options you can do to get yourself essentially some sort of static IP address. Obviously for IPv6, there's services like Tunnel Broker from Hurricane Electric that you can use to set up a GRE tunnel into them and get an IPv6 subnet routed down to you and get IPv6 that way. And even for IPv4, there are options that if you desperately need a static IP address, that you can have one. Andrews and Arnold, who I mentioned earlier, offer what's called their L2TP service, which costs £10 a month for a 200 megabit con connection with a 2 terabyte cap. And that will give you a static IPv4 address and a block of IPv6 addresses. And essentially all you do is you have your router set up, you'll need a fairly fancy router, but it connects to L2TP, essentially VPN connection, into them, and you can use that to route that static IP address down to your local network. Another option is you can use a cheap VPS, which is something I've actually done before. OVH are pretty good for this because they offer very cheap VPSs where you can add on additional IPv4 addresses for a single setup fee of like £2 per IP address and then nothing rolling per month. You can then set up a VPS to run, a, run some sort of VPN server, be it, be it L2TP, WireGuard, whatever you want, and use that to route that public IPv4 address down to your local network as though it's a static IP address. And then to provide a rough idea of pricing, at the time of making this video, to get an OVH VPS that's got a 250 megabit connection, that costs £5 a month. If you need a 500 megabit connection, that's £10 a month. And with both of those, you could relatively easily set them up to route public IPv4 addresses down to your local network and essentially give yourself a static IP address. 
of course, with both of those options, there will be penalties in terms of um, latency and potentially sort of having to decrease your MTU, but it, it is there and it is a viable option. So if you absolutely need a static IPv4 address, with that £20 a month difference, there are ways around it. And of course, you wouldn't necessarily need to route all your internet traffic over that tunnel out to OVH or Andrews and Arnold's. You could literally just use that only for incoming traffic to your static IP if you're, say, running a server at home. Now, for me, I'm not even going to do that. At least at the start, I don't really think I need a static IP address. I've had one with Plusnet for years, and at the time of setting up, it was nice. It was a £5 one-off fee, and I used to run servers at home, so it was quite useful. But nowadays, I don't really run much. I have a server at home, but it's not posting anything publicly accessible. The most I ever need to do is occasionally connect a VPN that's running at home, so I can connect in and you know, access files off my server or control my home automation. And for all of that sort of stuff, I can just use a dynamic DNS service. So I can just, you know, whatever, whatever, no IP or even host my own, something like that. Just have a dynamic DNS service that I can use to deal with my uh, dynamic IP address. It's perfectly fine. So yeah, big long rant about there about lots of different pricing and how to get static IP addresses, only for me to say I'm not getting a static IP address. But anyway, yeah. I don't get a static IP with Talk Talk, but I don't really need it. So yeah, now that's all the pricing out of the way, let's actually look at some stuff because that was a very long rant and I do apologise for how long that took, but I just wanted to get that information out there. As part of the setup process for GFAST, an open reach engineer needs to come, up, come to my flat and do some work. And in particular, as far as I'm aware, what they need to do is replace this master socket with a new NTE 5C socket and also supply and connect an open reach modem. You know, they, they say the engineer installs it, I mean, they, they plug it in and switch it on, but they need to supply the open reach modem as well. And as you might have seen in previous videos, I've done a few tweaks on my network, it's way over complicated. And in particular, I've installed this Mark III filter faceplate onto my master socket, and then run this Cat6 extension off of that, which comes up into the ceiling, round into my cabinet, and terminates at that RJ11 port on the patch panel up here. It then comes out of that, down there, and into my existing VDSL open reach modem. And that obviously works fine. And it is a perfectly supported setup. I remember when I did this, people were like, oh my god, that's illegal, you touched the master socket. It's not how it works. You are allowed to replace faceplates on these just as long as you're not taking it off the wall. And they're not going to prosecute you for touching a phone socket. But anyway, you are allowed to install these filter faceplates. That's perfectly legitimate. However, I just want to keep things as simple as possible for the engineer. I don't want them coming in and then trying to reconnect this onto the new filter faceplate or getting confused because this is here or anything like that. Plus, I did buy this filter faceplate myself, they didn't supply it, so I don't want the guy nicking that and walking off with it, even though I have no use for it. So what I'm going to do is before the engineer comes on site, I'm going to take this filter faceplate out and put the sort of phone system back to exactly how they would expect, where it's just a standard NTE5 socket with a microfilter plugged into it and then get this cable out of the way. Just get it as simple as possible for the engineer. So when they come, it's just a straight swap without any confusion. Just so, yeah, they, they can do all that and then I'll come back and I'll do everything myself. So yeah, we're going to do that. And then once they've been, I've been trying to think of how I'm going to do this because one option is that I just basically reinstate what I have here. The Cat6 comes down and one pair out of it connects onto the filtered output connection inside the master socket. And that extends the DSL GFAST connection up the modem in the cabinet. However, I don't think I'm going to do that this time. And that's because GFAST is extremely, well, apparently it was extremely fussy with um, distance and interference because it's such a high speed connection. And even though I'm sure this length of Cat6, which is maybe two meters, isn't going to cause a problem given it already has to run, you know, several hundred meters to the cabinet in presumably much worse cable than Cat6, I may as well keep things as short a distance as possible. So what I think I'm going to do, and I'll do it obviously later in this video, I'll actually be repurposing this Cat6 for regular gigabit Ethernet. I'll mount a network jack here, connected into this cable, and then I'll mount the modem on the wall somewhere here, because there's a socket here to power it. That way the modem can sit here connected straight into the master socket without any extensions, and then it'll be gigabit Ethernet up to the cabinet. That also means that the modem won't be in the cabinet, which previously I didn't like the idea of, but Actually, I think now I'd rather do that because they're just, it's, it's just taking up a lot of space in the cabinet. It's taking up an entire U. I mean, this little switch is, that's a future video. You'll see why that's there. Th that could go anywhere, really. If I could get that modem out of the cabinet, that could free up an entire U in this cabinet for extra stuff. So 
I'm not against moving it out of the cabinet and putting it down here, so yeah, I think that's what I might end up doing. But at any rate, the next step really is just to take this master socket, I'll take the filter face plate out, remove this CAT6 extension, and get it just working as they would expect with a microfilter connected to it. So yeah, time to go and do that. And I'll pop them while I'm doing it just to show how these work, because if you're in the UK you might find this useful, and if you're in another country you might find it interesting how UK phone sockets work. So yeah, time to take that apart. Okay, so here we have an NTE5 master socket. This is the older style, they've moved over to the NTE5C that you'll see later in the video, so it's a video where we'll show both of them. But this is the old style NTE5 that's been around for years, I think other ISPs maybe use them, well other providers I think Virgin Media do have a similar NTE5 type socket. But essentially this is the demarcation point for a UK phone line. What happens is OpenReach, or which you're the sort of network operator, terminate their connections into the back of this here. And then these additional plates can connect on. So as standard all you have is just a single faceplate with a phone jack so this top piece isn't there. And then you connect your phone into the front of it and you can wire phone extensions into the back of it. However you can also install these inter interspacing plate things like this which connect in. And this is a VDSL filter so this plugs in, the phone jack goes on the front and that allows me to then also have a built-in filter so the, the phone extensions don't have any DSL on them and then the modem can connect either into there or you can run an extension off the back of it. And that's just what you need, but well, you don't need that, you can use microfilters, but that's a better way to do it. It gives you a much better connection, it's just a lot neater than having microfilters. Plus, you then, if you do have analog phones, which I don't, you don't then need to have microfilters at every phone. You can, this just does all the filtering at a central point, which is nice. So let's take it apart. So you've got these two screws in the front which come off, and then the whole thing will sort of start to fall apart into several different parts. So take these out. These are very long screws because it's got the filter faceplate which comes with longer screws. I do wonder how many random faceplates you could fit into one of these without, you know, as, as like a legitimate reason. Because, yeah, it's got a lot. But, that's what we have. And then if we take these out, you'll see there's a couple of different parts. So the first part is this plate here. And this is going to go back on. What this does is this provides obviously the phone connection and is also where you connect your phone extensions. So if you look down the back here, you'll see Around the back there's a bunch of terminals and that is my analog phone extension so there's only one in the living room so that runs off to the living room and it's just three wires there basically there's one pair used for the actual voice and then one's a ringer wire for very old-fashioned phones and that then connects into this filter face plate and then this filter face plate's obviously added in this can come out and that also unplugs and this is all going to get very tangled because there's cable sort of caught in the bottom of it but that comes out, just pull that around there. We then have this filter faceplate. Let's try and get this out the back. This is the VDSL filter, so what you have is it again connects into the master socket on the back, and then it provides the filtered phone out here, which goes to this, therefore providing the DSL free phone on the front and the extensions on the back. It has the modem connection up here, which is for DSL, and then additionally, internally here, you'll see there's this extension connection which is just a single pair of IDC connections and that allows you to extend the DSL connection to another point. So I've got this bit of CAT6 on here and then just the blue pair is just connected onto these two terminals which are labelled A and B. And that extends my DSL connection up to the patch panel. Most people won't have this, it's pretty rare, but I put it in. So that's the filter face plate out of the way and we're going to be taking that out, so let's put that over there just now. Then finally down the back here, you'll see what we have called the test socket. And this is a really smart design with these, it's, I really like it. And basically what you have here is obviously you've got this part here which is where you connect your phone and all your phone extensions. Now if you unplug this, you've then got the phone socket here. But notice your extensions aren't connected anymore. So the only things connected to this is basically whatever you plug into here and OpenReach's wiring. There's nothing else in between. Everything here is OpenReach's responsibility. So anything that plugs on the front, so your filter face plates, your phone extensions, all this sort of stuff, is the customer's responsibility and the customer owns it. So you know that's why you're allowed to take it apart and install some extension wiring, stuff like that. But everything that's on the wall here is OpenReach's responsibility and OpenReach owns it. Which means that if you have a fault, quite often what they'll tell you to do is to take the front off and plug your modem or your phone or whatever directly into the test socket. If the fault clears, then you know that the, the ISP knows that the fault is with your home wiring, it's with your either your filter faceplate or your extension wiring or something like that. 
However, if you take that all off and the fault's still there, then it kind of proves that the problem is the open reaches issue because it's not affected by any of your extension wiring, that's all disconnected. So it's quite a neat setup. We'll take a look at the NTE5C because it's a newer style and it's, a bit, it's actually a bit smarter, but yeah, that's what you have there. So essentially all we have here is there's my extension wiring on, onto the front plate, and now all we need to do is we just basically plug that directly into there. And that's basically removed my filter face plate. So now if you screw that back on using a pair of shorter screws that I had to go and find because that was helpful, um, that will just go on the front there. And that's basically now what the flat came with. When I first moved in, this is what I had, was just an NTE5 master socket with the standard face plate and no additional filters. And I've lost a screw under a plug. Great. Um, and that's basically what I had there. So we just need to screw this front on. I think I get this screw out. Great, there we go. And that will put everything back to how, well, OpenReach expected it. And as I mentioned, and people are gonna freak out, you're perfectly allowed to do this. You are allowed to replace face plates on these. I just want to take the front face plate off just to simplify it. And because I did buy this myself, I, I don't want the OpenReach guy running away with it, even though, as I said, I, I don't actually have any use for it. So yep, that's there, and now this can actually basically come out. So we can pull this whole cable out, disconnect that from in there, and then this can just totally go away. And then obviously I'll reinstate that Cat6 later when I want to put a network jack in. But yeah, that's there. Okay, so there we go, that's all taken out and put back to what they'd expect. So just the master socket itself, without any sort of filter face plate, standard microfilter plugged in, this thing's absolutely ancient, but it seems to work. Um, and then I've just got a, basically just an RG11 cable just going up and into the rack and into the modem. I'll probably disconnect this before they come just so it's literally just, right, here's your socket, here's the top top router, make it work. Um, and then I've just taken the, the Cat6 out and I've just basically cut it off and i pushed it up in the ceiling so the, the slack's still there. I've just pushed it to get it out of the way so I can pull this back down again and re-terminate re it into the network jack when I'm ready. But yeah, that's sort of all taken out there. So the final thing I need to do before the OpenReach engineer visits is to finally sort my living room phone extension. Ages ago I replaced all these sockets with nice metal stainless steel ones and at the time of ordering they just didn't have the phone neuro module. This particular product line doesn't supply like a standard faceplate that's just a phone socket, they only do neuro modules, but there just wasn't stock of a phone neuro module so I just never bothered buying one and just blanked, <laughs> blanked it off like this and it's been like this for ages. But just given there's already phone extension wiring in and the OpenReach engineer might need to test it, I kind of need to reinstate this phone socket just so if they do need to go, oh, can I test your extensions? There is an extension, I'm not just like, um, the extension is there, there's, there's no socket. So I'm just going to put that in. So I've just bought a cheap Euro module, it's just a cheap Knightsbridge one, and that'll do the job. It's just a standard BT extension Euro module. So that there, that's all we need to do, so we just need to fit that in here. Now, you'll notice on the back of this, there's a bunch of components. And that's because this is technically a master socket module, not a secondary socket module. In the UK, you have different types of sockets. You have a master socket module, which has a ringer capacitor, which is for very old phones that needs a lot of power to ring, like they've got mechanical bells, a surge suppressor for suppressing surges, presumably, and a resistor, which is used by equipment at the exchange to test the line. They can obviously look for that resistor and check it's there. Now, I don't know why they still sell these master modules so widely, because basically almost everyone has a sort of NTE5 master socket that you would never replace with one of these and you're not meant to but just at the time of ordering they only had stock of master modules they didn't have stock of secondary modules which seems to be quite common however I'll just show you one quick tip you can do with these is they're actually very easy to convert because all these components the capacitor the surge suppressor and the resistor are all placed in parallel across different connections on the socket and different IDC connections so literally all you need to do is cut these, con these components off and then it'll work as a secondary mo module. It feels very wrong doing it, but that is literally all you need to do. So take the module here. This was literally just because it was the only one that was in stock. And all we need to do is use some snips. Obviously you could take apart and desolder it, I'm not gonna bother. But just literally snip off the capacitor. And then if you can get down here and get into the surge suppressor and the resistor. There we go. Can get the resistor as well. in there, is that there, and then just snip all these components off and that's all we need to do. And this is something I've actually had to do before because I, I, it was for a friend I was installing 
I was working on their, their phone extensions. They'd got an NT5C fitted and the engineer hadn't connected any of their extension sockets. But then I looked and all their extension sockets were master sockets for some reason. The builders had put the wrong ones in, which is always very helpful. So I wonder if that's maybe why the engineer hadn't connected it. It's because they were all the wrong type of socket. So I just ended up going around and cutting off all the components because they were like metal crab tree ones and they're going to be expensive to replace with the correct ones. So I was like, well, maybe I'll just cut them off and convert them basically. So the job we need to do is just snip all these components off, which is surprisingly hard to do leaning over a camera, but I'll keep trying to do it on camera for some reason because apparently this is what I think people would want to watch. But there we go, that came off. I finally get that surge suppressor off, which I might need to... Maybe I'll get into it, let's see. Might just bend that back and forward, snap it off, but yeah, just need to break these components off and that'll convert this to a standard secondary module. Okay, so that's now taken apart and basically removed all those components and that's now going to work as a secondary module. So all we now need to do is take off this faceplate and fit the module. So pop that off there, pop that off there. I wonder if I can maybe do this without actually having to take the, unscrew the Euro module itself. Yeah, that'll actually come off fine. So yes, definitely not where you're meant to do it, but these blanking plates come out very easily so I don't need to actually undo those screws. And there obviously we have the existing extension wiring. So all we need to do is take these existing wires, which are just the blue pair and the orange, which is the ringer wire, and punch these down onto the appropriate terminals on the um, phone jack. And basically just need to match up the numbering between here and the master socket. So I've taken a photo of that, so I just need to punch those down. Okay, so that's the wires positioned as they should be, matching the master socket. So I just need to basically punch these down with a standard punch down tool. There we go. That's popped out. You also technically can disconnect that ringer wire, the orange one if you, you don't actually need it and it can cause issues but because I've got the filter faceplate I should be fine so as well reconnect it there we go got it off try it again there we go and then that one there There we go, probably very hard to see on camera, but there we go. So that's now all punched down. There's the phone extension socket connected, so we just need to basically put that into the back box there, like that. Yeah, all the way up. And then put the blanking plates either side just to fill it in. And annoyingly, those blanking plates are not remotely the same shade of white as the module itself, so that's going to suck. But what I'll do is I've just, I'm going to order a single module faceplate because that's a a dual module faceplate, it's just the ones I had. Um, I'm going to order one of these that's just a single module faceplate, so it'll be, sta more, it'll be stainless steel where this white is and it'll just be the module in the front and that'll look a lot better, but yeah. That's it installed, so now let's quickly test this out. Okay, so that's it installed there and I've now just connected up a cheap landline phone, literally the world's worst landline phone, um, just to test something with it. And I don't use a landline, I just bought the phone just for testing phone lines. Um, and if we pick that up, there should be a dial tone. Hold up the microphone there. That's working. So now, if I dial the open reach test number, which is 17070. This circuit is defined as 0131. Welcome to your open reach line test facilities. Please press 1 for ring back, 2 for quiet line, 3 for fast test, 4 for fast cleanse, or clear down. Ring back test, please clear down. Okay, so that's a ring back test, so if I hang up the phone, it should phone back. There we go. Ring back test completed. Goodbye. There we go, so that's the line working, so just, that was a quick test. Just, so yeah, I can make out, make outbound calls, receive calls, and um, it'll ring. So yeah, if I ever wanted to use a landline, I can do it. Not that I will, I'll just unplug it, because if I ever have a landline, all I do is just get junk calls. So get rid of that, but that's now ready there, and then... Once I get a new faceplate, I'll swap that over and it'll look a lot nicer than having those mismatched coloured blanks, but yeah. That's that done. Okay, so now back a couple of days later, and I've replaced this Euromodule plate with a single module one, so that looks a lot better than the one that had all the blanks in it. And then quickly, because I'm actually reviewing the service, I should probably take a look at the router. Obviously I'm not going to use this, but they do send the router in advance. And even though I'm definitely not going to use this, I will need this because that's what the OpenReach engineer is going to set up. And also it's quite good to have this handy because 
with Plusnet, for example, if I ever had an issue where I phoned them up and had a, an issue with like an outage or something, they're always going to ask you the scripted questions of what colour is the broadband light? And then if you explain you don't have a broadband light because you're not using their router, they get all confused and then it breaks the script and then it all goes wrong. So what I usually do is I'll keep the ISP router in a box, just keep it handy so that if something ever goes wrong, I, I disconnect all my kit, plug their kit in, and then it's much easier when you phone them just to play dumb and just go, oh, the light's gone orange. You know, it's a bit easier trying to explain that you've got your own router. So, yeah. This is the Wi-Fi hub. I, I hate the t naming of these things. Wi-Fi hub, smart hub. Just call it magical Wi-Fi box for, you know, if you're trying to dumb it down. But yeah, Ethernet cable, obviously need one of them. It is actually a four pair cable. That's nice because half the time you buy a router, it comes with one of those rubbish two pair cables that then doesn't do gigabit and then you get confused. And then power adapter, just standard, presumably. UK adapter, yep, that'll go in there and that's power adapter for the router. And then under here, we'll have the router. Now, Talk Talk actually advertise, they sell these them separately as well, you can buy them. And it's like £120 for this. I mean, it's it looks nice on paper, to be fair. It's, you know, it's all gigabit Ethernet ports. It's got 4x4, I think, AC Wi-Fi. It's, it's decently specced, but I just wouldn't use it. I just don't, it's made by Stagium.com. I think the it's got model number. It's um, the Stagium.com Fast 5464. Um, and it's decently specced, but I just never would use a sort of all the one router like this, I'd rather use my own kit. But yeah, that's there. It's a big thing. It looks cool, but I'm definitely not going to use this. Um, it's almost annoying that they insist on including it because it's just a waste. Like, this will never actually get used. It's going to sit in a box. But yeah, that's it there. It's got a little stand that presumably stands on a table like that. Yeah, it does. It's got the car on the back with the credentials, which you can definitely steal because I'm not going to be using them. Um, gigabit Ethernet ports, Gigabit WAN port, and then the built-in DSL modem. And this is what I mentioned before, this modem connection is not GFAST capable. So they're going to supply an open reach modem that will connect into the WAN port here. And that's one of the other benefits of TalkTalk, Talk, is that this thing doesn't support GFAST, which is actually kind of what I want. So I've got this port here labelled phone, labelled digital voice. Don't know what's behind that. Well, I suspect what will be behind that, actually, will just be some sort of RG11 type phone jack. Uh, yeah, there you go. Oh, just a BT phone jack. There you go. And what that will be is... In the future, if they ever get rid of, well, when they get rid of analog phone lines, that would allow them to provide some sort of VoIP service where this could be essentially the PBX for VoIP and then this would plug into your phone extension wiring. And I think even OpenReach provided an NTE5C faceplate now that's got a connection for feeding voice back into your phone extensions. So yeah, that's what that is. Obviously I'm not using that, well, I'm not using any of this, but yeah, that's the slide router there, which I'll just need to keep handy for when the OpenReach engineer comes and then I'll probably be putting it back in its box. But yeah, that's the router there. And I'm back. So it's a couple of days later, and the OpenReach guy's been. So the main thing he did is he's replaced the matter socket with an NT5C, and obviously did some connections at the cabinet. And just to provide a sort of rough review, they're very good. He phoned sort of before he, well, he phoned from the van saying he was about to do the work, gave me about five minutes notice for my connection being cut off, cut the connection off, did some work in the cabinet, and about half an hour later he came round and replaced the master socket. So. Replace the master socket with this new NTE5C, which also now has a GFAST filter faceplate on it. And then installed the OpenReach modem and set up the TalkTalk Talk router. So that's all sitting down here for now. I told him just, just dump it somewhere, obviously I was going to replace it, so I just said just stick it on the floor, so that's what he left it with. And yeah, it's all set up and working. And I've done a speed test, at least with this just as it is now, and I get around about 290 megabits down, 47 or so up, and that's over Wi-Fi on this router. So that's really good, that's way more than they estimated. And the guy did say that my line is actually really good. I think I think he said it's only 50 metres from, me from here to the cabinet, so I do have a very good line, but yeah. 200, 290 megabit over copper is pretty impressive. So obviously that's all installed in there. And that's the master socket replaced here. Now obviously I need to now get this properly set up because I don't exactly want this set up. So as I mentioned, what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to mount the modem here this cable goes to the aerial amplifier, so I'll take that out, plug that aerial amp in up into that socket up there, just to get it out of the way. I can then mount the modem on the wall down here, and then I'll extend that old bit of Cat6 that used to be used to extend the phone line that's sticking out the ceiling there, bring it down in trunking, and put it into a new sort of RG45 faceplate here. So I can mount the modem here, connect it into the master socket, connect the WAN connection up into this over Ethernet, rather than having extending the DSL connection, that'll connect it up to the router up in the cabinet. And yeah, that should be a lot neater. 
The only bit of additional work I'll need to do is that this plug for the modem does drip, does sort of droop down way below the socket. So that won't fit into the socket here. It'll hit the consumer unit. So I'll have to move the socket up a little bit, but there's plenty of slack in the consumer unit for this, so that should be fine. So I need to move that socket up a little bit as well, but yeah, it shouldn't be too much work. So I'll go away off, go away off camera and get all that done. And then we'll come back, show the fin finished setup, and then I'll do some final speed tests. But so far, I'm definitely very happy with the performance and how well it all works. So yeah, definitely seems very good value for £39 a month. So yeah, time to get all this installed and then show what I've done. And we're back. So I've done a little bit tidying up because obviously previously it was just piled up on the floor because I was going to sort it later. So I've neatened it all up. So let's take a look at what I've done. So as you can see, I've lifted the socket up because it was previously too close to the consumer unit so you couldn't plug any sort of power adapters into the first two sockets. And even the last one was a little bit dodgy for that. So I lifted it up a fair bit to give loads of space to plug stuff in. And I've also put the cable in trunking because it was previously just, previously just a bit twin and earth just coming up the wall. So I've put a bit of trunking over that to make it a bit neater. So yeah, it's done there. The master socket I've not changed at all, but as you can see, I've mounted the modem on the wall. It's dead easy to do because it's just got some hooks in the or you know slots in the back you can put a screw in, so that was dead easy to do, nicely mounted up there. And that frees up space in the cabinet, so I don't need to worry about having it sitting on the shelf, I can just have it sitting on the wall here out of the way. I've also noticed that there is actually quite a bit of heat, not a lot, but like a little bit of heat coming out the top, so it's probably not a bad idea to keep this ventilated because especially if this is doing high speed stuff with GFAST, it might get a little bit warm. So yeah, it's all installed there. Then you'll the other thing I've done is I've added this new network point. So as I mentioned, I didn't want to extend the DSL connection up to the cabinet because GFAST is so high speed, I didn't want to risk, you know, just adding interference or causing issues. So I decided just to put the modem on the wall and extend it over Ethernet instead. So I've reused that bit of Cat6 because it was perfectly fine. So that now comes down the wall inside this trunking, down here, and into this network point. I've labelled that modem link to cabinet so that goes up to the rack. And yeah, that's in there, and if you look up in the cabinet, you'll see around here, there's now... Uh, I've replaced that RG11 module with an RG45 CAT6 module, and that comes straight down and into the router there. So, that's there. I need to label that up, forgot to do that, but yeah, that's fine. And yeah, that's now what was installed. And then, for the aerial lamp, I've just basically moved the plug just to plug it into that socket up there, just to keep it out of the way, so that's freed up space down here, doesn't it? looks a lot neater, like compared to before where I had cables trailing down that wall. Even though the trunking job isn't the best, that is still relatively neat, so definitely very happy with that. And you'll take this apart in a minute to see what's inside, but basically, standard network module. I've done my usual where I've used a keystone module with an angled faceplate, because I really like having an angled faceplate with the cable coming down rather than sticking straight out. I like trying different brands of stuff with my personal things, so I can just get experience or decide what I want to use long term. So this is actually from Connectix, whereas pre previously I've used a lot of Excel stuff. So it's a Connectix faceplate, Euro module, Keystone Jack, all that sort of stuff. It seems fine and it's nice to try alternatives. Although the only issue I had with this is that I bought a few of them, because um, I've got a few other projects I need to use them for. And this one that I put in, the little window that covers the label just kept falling out. It wouldn't stay in place. So I had to swap the window from one of the other jacks and now it's in fine. So slight quality control issue there, you know. Hopefully it's a one-off and you couldn't, you know, you're not going to cable an entire house and find that half your modules have the win windows falling out, but yeah, that's fine. It's labelled up neatly there, so yeah, dead happy with that. So yeah, that's all sort of installed there. So before I do any sort of speed test, which I'll do in a minute, what we'll quickly do is we'll pop, it, pop, pop a couple of bits open, take a look inside that network da jack, take a look inside the new, a look inside the new master socket just to see what it's like, and then we'll do some speed tests. Okay, so the first thing we'll take a look inside is just this network point. I mean, it's not that exciting, just show what I've done. But as I've done previously, I'm using a separate U Euro module and a keystone jack. A lot of the time in the UK and presumably in Europe as well, you have a Euro module that just clicks on a faceplate like this and you punch directly onto the back of it. This is slightly different. What you do is you put a keystone jack on the cable. In this case, I've used a nice toolless one, which is great. You just put the wires in, clip it shut, and it makes a connection. And then separately, you have this shutter module, which is a Euro module, it's just already clipped in the plate, so I can take that out, basically the shutter module and two blanks. And what you can then do, is you then take the keystone jack, and it's probably going to be hard to do one-handed, but you can basically then put it in the back there, and then clip it in, like that, and that gives you the module. I quite, I quite like doing these because it gives you an angled faceplate, which I really like, but what it also does is it means you can quite easily replace the faceplate in the Euro module 
without having to re-terminate the jack. It's a fairly niche use case, so it's not a huge deal, but I have had a situation before where I tripped over a cable and it pulled the Euro module out of the plate and broke the clips on the Euro module. Because it used a, used a separate shutter, that was ideal because all I did was buy another shutter, clip the Keystone jack in and didn't need to touch any wiring. Whereas with this, because yes, the clips in the Euro module would break, the Keystone jack would still be fine so you can re-terminate it or re-click it in without, without having to re-terminate it. Not a big deal, it's just how I've done it. But mainly it's just for this angled faceplate, so yeah, that's that there. Quite a tight bend radius in there, unfortunately, but it's really the best I can do because it's trunking, so I can't push up into the trunking, really, because otherwise it'll get all really messy. And it's a fairly shallow patris, but it's fine. I'm not putting too much of a bend radius on it, it's just a single cable. So yeah, that's fine. That's that network point there. And next up down here, we have the new NTE5C master socket with GFAST faceplate. So as you can see, the modem is plugged in with just a standard RG11 to RG11 cable. This is the one it came with. And it's a shielded cable, which is nice, although I don't know how essential that is given it's... There's a shielded jack on the modem, but not on the master socket, and this isn't earth. It might be okay. I suppose it helps at least having some sort of metal in there, but yeah, that's the cable there. I've not taken it apart, but it does at least feel sort of round, so it's not... A, I hope it's not a presumably totally flat cable, it's hopefully a twisted pair, but it's the one they gave me. I'm somewhat tempted to replace this with a shorter one, maybe a bit of Cat5 or something, just because it is quite long enough, sort of bundled all the excess up down there, which isn't ideal, but it's still sinking at the maximum speed, so it's probably not a big deal. And yep, this is the new NTE5C Master Socket. And in comparison to the old one, it's got quite a few improvements. So the first one is that it's now screwless, you don't have to actually use screws to take the front off. There's just these little clips on the side that you clip in, and that pulls the front off. And the way this works is that, unlike the first, the original one, where you had to, you had the front plate that your phone socket was on and your extensions wired into, then the back plate and you put plates in the middle. This one, you only have one front plate. So that's, this is a GFAST plate, so it's got the modem port and the phone port and the splitter all built in. But there's not that separate phone plate on the front. And you'll also notice that there's no extensions hanging off of this. That's because I've actually got a really smart design here, where all the extensions wire into this block here, which is all just, it's like a punch down block, but it's actually sort of, it's a lever thing, you lift that up, and then you put the wires in and you clip it down so it punches it, so you don't actually have to use a separate punch down tool, it's quite nice. And you see my extension wiring's into there. And what's quite interesting to see is the open each guy's connected the blue wires, but he's actually left the orange ringer wire disconnected. And I suppose that makes sense because realistically nowadays the ringer wire isn't used and it's generally just seen as a source of potential interference. As far as I'm aware these plates presumably should isolate the ringer wire anyway just because it's designed for high speed broadband but yeah they've not connected the ringer wire that's fine I mean I suppose he's probably just thinking ahead saying like yeah it's probably not required so may as well leave it disconnected in case it causes problems so yeah the ringer wire is not connected into point three but you know if you connected that it would work but I don't really need a ringer wire nowadays. But what's quite smart with this is as you can see you've got the test socket as I mentioned earlier but the extensions are connected to this. But the way these work is actually really smart. If you look at the faceplate you put on you can see on the top of that connector is like a standard phone jack but on the bottom there's those additional contacts. And the way this works is that if you want to use your test socket you can just plug a normal phone straight into that and it'll make the connection and it'll work just like a test socket won't connect to your extensions and it'll connect directly onto the incoming line from, from OpenReach. However, if you plug this faceplate in, what that'll do is it connects those normal phone pins in the top of that socket to those three separate pins in the bottom of the socket which go to your extensions. So with that, with that faceplate off, that's your test socket, plug your phone in there, go straight onto the OpenReach line. But then if you plug this faceplate on, or any faceplate onto this, that then connects your extensions up. And that actually threw me the first time I ever worked on one of these because I, it was a friend that OpenReach hadn't connected the extensions for some reason and he needed to use a phone extension. So I put them onto the block, punched it down, went through, plugged stuff in, nothing was working, got really confused because I hadn't clipped the front plate back on. He didn't have a filter plate, he just had a normal phone jack and I just hadn't thought to clip it back on. Clipped it back on, everything worked. So pretty cool design, actually, I like it. And then here we have the new GFast filter face plate. This is basically the same design as the normal VDSL one. It's presumably just got fancier stuff in it for GFAST. You've got your regular BT phone point there. You've got a point there for your modem that, interestingly, is actually an RG45 port. It's the same as on the old one, where even though they supply an RG11 or whatever 
fixed size of connector, like 8P or 6P, 4C, whatever they call it, connector, RG11 connector. That's what they supply on the cables, and it will fit in an RG45 port. It does actually have an RG45 connector in it, so you can actually plug a regular Cat6 or whatever Ethernet cable into that and use that for the cable. Now, obviously, it won't do Ethernet, it's just a DSL connection, but it's kind of nice having that option. Unfortunately, the modem doesn't have that, it's only got a regular RG11 connection, so I can't use like a regular Ethernet cable to connect this into this. But it does mean that if, say for example, in the future, rather than having the modem here, I or someone else did want to extend the GFAST connection up to the cabinet, you could actually just take this cable out of the modem, plug it into this GFAST port, and that would ex actually extend the GFAST DSL connection up to the patch panel, and you could just use a RG45 to RG11 cable into the modem. So. Yeah, it's kind of neat that that's actually, that is actually an RG45 port in there. Also means if you did ever want to make your own cable up, you could actually use an RG45 on one end. For example, if I wanted to say shorten this, I could cut one end off and just crimp an RG45 on, and then that would work. So yeah, pretty interesting, but yeah, that's the faceplate there. And the final thing is on the back, you do still have an extension for a connection for like DSL extensions. Is that new style, so what you do is you put the wires in this little clear piece, you shut it, and that then makes the connection. And you can see they're labelled A and B, or well, upside down, A and B there. So you can sit, put a single, just pair of wires onto that and extend your DSL or GFAST connection. Now, as I mentioned, I'm not going to do that because I've put the modem here, but it's kind of nice to have that option because, especially, for example, if you were using your ISP's provided router and it had built-in GFAST, so I don't, I have to use this, but if your ISP router did have built-in GFAST, and you lived, say, here, you probably don't want your router sitting on top of your consumer unit in a cupboard. So it would be nice to be able to actually use those to extend that to a different point. For example, I could extend those through to the living room and connect it in there. The other probably bad idea I'm having right now is actually to use this here, because with this in place, this plug sticks out quite far and it just, in my mind, looks a bit daft. It's fine, but it's mildly not super aesthetically pleasing. So I'm actually half tempted to get a bit of solid core Cat 6 or Cat 5 just because you really need solid core to punch down onto these. Punch down onto that and bring the cable out the bottom of the master socket up the side here and crimp an RG11 on. So essentially it's plugged into the modem and then it comes down and goes straight and it's solidly connected into that. I mean, it's it will work exactly the same. There's no real reason to do it for any sort of performance benefit but I'm somewhat tempted to do it purely from a neatness perspective of not having all this cable bundled up under here because I could just have a very single neat little bit of Cat5 come outside up here and into there without any excess cable, without anything hanging out the front of the jack but yeah, that's just a random idea I had might, might get of a go, why, why not, but yeah all you need to do is we just put that back on there oh, if I can clip it in there you go without catching cable underneath there you go, that clips on nicely and then you can just plug that connector into the front there. So, yep, that's finished setup. So that's a tour of just inside some of the bits as well. So what I'll now do is I'll go away and do some speed tests and then come back with my sort of final thoughts. And we're back. I've now got it all set up in my Unify UDM Pro and it's working. And this was super easy to set up. Whereas previously with my with Plusnet, I had to use PPPoE, so you had to set a username and password in the interface and configure all that. Whereas with this, it just uses DHCP, so it works out the box. I literally need to plug the router into the modem, turn it all on, set the interface to use DHCP because it was set to PPPoE before, and it just worked. And in fact, I think out of the box this would default to working because I think the Unify defaults using PPPoE or using DHCP, so that's dead easy. The other benefit with DHCP is that you don't end up having any of your packets going over the WAN, WAN interface being encapsulated in anything. With PPPoE, all of your traffic has to get encapsulated inside PPPoE packets, which means that your MTU of your WAN interface is 1492 bytes rather than a full 1500 that you'd expect with Ethernet. I found historically this has caused issues with certain things where certain websites won't load or certain things will just freeze up or not just work quite right, you just have weird issues. And it's usually if the other end is misconfigured and is sending packets that are too big and it's ignoring requests from your equipment to fragment the packets, but it's still not ideal. With Plusnet, they did support what's called baby jumbo frames, so you could set the appropriate MTUs on your WAN interface on your router and essentially get the full 1500-byte packets on your, on your WAN interface. However, that's not 
not doable on the UDM. It just doesn't support that. So I've been living with a 4092 MTU on my WAN interface. And it's been okay, but it's still just, I've had issues previously. Not with Unify, but with Microtech and Vios and PFSense, I've had issues. But with this, because it's DHCP, you don't have that issue. My WAN interface has a full 1500 bytes MTU, so it just works. So that's a really nice thing to see. It makes things so much simpler. So yeah, is it working? So what we'll now do is we'll go and take a look at some speed tests. So first of all, we'll take a look at my old speed. I did a speed test before I got the connection disconnected. Take a look at what I had before, and we'll take a look at what I had now, because it's quite an upgrade. Okay, so here we are on Plusnet using the old, doing a speed test on the old connection. And we'll just let that start. As you can see, I've been getting around about 70 megabit, just under 70, which is what you'd expect for a VDSL2 connection if you're quite close to the cabinet. It's been perfectly fine for years, but given I was paying more than I am now for this, I may as well get the upgrade. So yeah, 70 down, and then I'll get about 20 up, or, you know, it, it wouldn't even hit that, maybe 16, 17, 18 up. And that was, again, fine previously, but now that I'm filming all, all my videos in 4K, an average video of mine can be about 50 gig, so being able to upload that faster than this would be very, very helpful. So yeah, that's my old connection there. Now let's take a look at what we get now. So now let's do a speed test for the new connection. So we'll start that there. Both these tests are done over a wired Ethernet connection, of course. And we'll see what this does. And there you go, that's quite a bit faster. So we're literally hitting over 300 megabit. Now, given this is TalkTalk Talk Fiber 250 and the estimated 250 megabit, this is pretty good. Now, obviously, as, as I said, the OpenReach guy said, I am very close to the cabinet and I've got a very good line. But yeah, over 300 megabit over a DSL copper connection. So that's quite impressive. So for all those people that have seen my videos previously and seen the fact I've got a DSL connection, you know, it's coming over a phone line going, oh my God, you've got all that fancy equipment with DSL. Oh, how is that terrible? You need cable and fiber. Well... DSL's still got some life left in it, <laughs> you know, that's pretty impressive. And then of course we get 50, me 50 megabit up as well, so that's huge. So yeah, that's the sort of speed test results. And of course, yeah, it's not as good as probably your gigabit symmetric fibre, but given all I have coming into here is a copper phone line, being able to get these speeds is pretty awesome. And it'll be a massive improvement over what I had before, especially for uploading videos with that 50 megabit upload. So there we go, that's a look at my new broadband connection. And as you can probably see, the speeds are pretty good. You know, yeah, it's not gigabit symmetric or anything, but given all I have is a phone line, well, being able to get 300 meg down and 50 up is pretty impressive. So, yeah, really happy with it. I'm definitely quite happy with how all this sort of, you know, cabling turned out. Definitely a lot neater than I had before. And I quite like having the modem down here. It frees up a lot of space in that rack for future stuff. So, yeah, I'm very happy with it. Now, of course, I've literally had it connected for a few hours at this point, so I can't give a full long-term review of reliability or anything like that. But at least as far as everything goes right now, it seems really good. So there you go. That was a sort of very long-winded video, and if someone's found this just looking for a review of Talk Talk Broadband, they're probably going to be infuriated as to how much I rambled on. But a sort of fairly detailed video looking at sort of how I'm using this connection as more of a sort of advanced user, talking about some stuff around how you can get around things like not having a static IP address, stuff like that, and doing a bit of a more in-depth look at the hardware you get, how you can use it with your own router, and all this sort of stuff here, rather than just sort of Oh, I'll plug the router in and it worked, and here's a speed test on my phone, you know, just to give me a bit more in-depth stuff, so... Yeah, that's my new broadband connection, so... Definitely looking forward to uploading this particular video, because... I'll be able to see how fast it uploads, because previously the upload speed has been a little bit of a problem, so... Yeah, definitely really happy with that. So yeah, there we go. Thank you very much for watching.